Let me go ahead and say good evening to everyone. I hope you have been thoroughly blessed throughout your day today as you went to work and school or whatever it is you may have done. And I'm very glad to see every single one of you with us this evening. The Lord has been blessing us night after night. We have been going through the Word of God and we started our evening off on Sunday where we talked about a subject called Time is Almost Finished. And we went into a little bit about Bible prophecy and we were looking through two lenses. We were seeing prophecy fulfilled in the world, but we also saw last night prophecy fulfilled in the church. And these were very solemn subjects because it brought us face to face with a lot of realities that made us ask ourselves some questions. To just say, Lord, am I, where do I stand with you? I see that the world is going in a certain direction. I see many in the church are going in a certain direction. You promise that you're going to do certain things that's going to afford for the completion of your work and the ushering in of Jesus. And Lord, I just want to be ready. I want to be on your side for our whole theme is prepare to meet your God. And I want to let you know, family, that sometimes we need to be alerted to the realities in which we face. If there's one thing God's people love to do is to sleep and to slumber, spiritually speaking. We love to just allow ourselves to go into sometimes even a false state of carnal security. It's for these reasons that there are times that God will send his messengers. and He will go ahead and give us a message that will alert our minds and help us to see our need to not run to the hills and not run to the armory, but to run to Jesus, to be able to find a true friend in him and to realize that his arms are outstretched, just waiting for every single one of us that we may come to him. And so tonight, as we reviewed our own hearts and looked at the landscape of what's going on in our world, tonight I have the privilege of sharing with you the message of the hour. The message of the hour. That's the title of our message this evening, the message of the hour. And like I told you, night after night, when you come here, three things you need to bring. Who remembers what the three things are? What's the first thing you need to bring when you come here? Got to bring your Bible. What's the second thing you need to bring? You want to bring a pen and paper or some ability to take down notes. What's the third thing you need to bring? Prayerful state of heart. Prayerful heart. You want to remember, don't ever come and listen to these messages and say, Lord, I hope they are listening. Right? Isn't it funny how we do that? Oh, Lord, I hope that they caught that point the preacher just said. But no, God says, you come and you make sure that you're listening. You make sure that you're hearing what the Spirit wants to say to you. And so as we get ready to go through our study this evening, the message of the hour, once again, I am going to have the privilege to pray, and I enjoy to pray, and I want to pray on my knees. And I would like to invite you that if you would like to, and if you're able to, to kneel with me. But if you can't kneel, that's all right. You bow your heads where you are, but let's pray together as we prepare our hearts to receive the word. Our loving Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the privilege and the opportunity to hear heaven speak while we on earth remain silent before thee. Lord, we thank you for the privilege to allow us to wake up and see our great need for Christ, our righteousness. And Lord, as we go night after night just through the study of your word, we realize we can't understand these sacred words except it be by the help of your Holy Spirit. And so we ask that you'll please forgive us of our sins. We pray that you will send your Holy Spirit, who's the only effectual teacher of truth. And we pray that you'll make your words plain to our heart and minister to us and open our eyes and help us behold wondrous things out of your word. And Lord, we thank you in advance for not only hearing, but answering this prayer. For we ask it all in Jesus' name. Let everyone say, Amen. Amen. All right. If anybody wants to know what's the message of the hour, there's no question in my mind that it is the blessed herald of the first, the second, and the third angel's message. And I want you to see what the Bible says about it, so I'm going to ask us to please turn our Bibles to the book of Revelation, the 14th chapter. We're going to consider the first, the second, and the third angel's message. This is, or these are, the messages of the hour. And we're going to prove that biblically because we learned a little bit about knowing what time it is. So when we know what time it is, we know what to do. Well, here it is that the Bible says in Revelation 14, 
Now, because these are quite a bit of verses here, I'm going to ask if we can please read alternately. So I'll do verse 6, you'll do verse 7, I'll do verse 8, you'll do verse 9, and then we'll take it down to verse 15. So we're in Revelation, the 14th chapter. Now, if you're there, please let me know by saying, Amen. All right. In Revelation 14, starting at verse 6, the Bible says, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to them that dwell on the earth, to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. And there followed another angel, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. Now, as we just read these messages, one of the things that we get very clearly is that the three angels' messages are given right before what we would call harvest time. In verse 15, you saw that there was a harvest, right? Now, for any of us who do any type of gardening, how many gardeners we have in the room? Any gardeners? Anyone? Okay, one, two, all right, out of a whole group of us. Well, let me let you in on a little bit about gardening. So when you do gardening, Here's a pop quiz question. I hope you don't mind a pop quiz. When we do gardening, which part represents when the, food is, when the fruit is ready? Is it at the planting side or is it at the harvest time? It's at the harvest time, right? So harvest time represents a time where the fruit is ripe. It's ready. You follow that? So here it is that the Bible just talked about how when the Son of Man comes, the reason he's coming is because the harvest is ripe. The people are ready. So what we know is that the last expression of the gospel to be given to the world right before harvest time are these three angels' messages. Now, I wanted to know what harvest time represents, and we can let the Bible be the best interpreter of itself. Scripture is always the key that unlocks Scripture. So I want you to go to Matthew 13, and we're going to go ahead and let the Bible tell us what represents harvest time. In Matthew, the 13th chapter, the Bible actually tells us what constitutes harvest time. So here it is that in Matthew 13, Jesus is giving a parable, actually two, one parable is the parable of the sower. The other parable is the parable of the wheat and the tares. We're looking into the parable of the wheat and the tares. At first, Jesus speaks in symbolic language, but what we're about to read is where Christ unfolds what harvest time represents amongst the many other characters. It's in Matthew 13 in verse 39. In Matthew 13 and verse 39, watch how Christ decodes the symbolic language that he was using. It says in Matthew 13 and verse 39, it says, the enemy that sowed them is who? The devil. 
And then he says, the harvest is what? The end of the world, or the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. So when we read in Revelation 14, where right after the three angels' messages are given, harvest time comes. Remember, it talked about reapers, and they said, thrust in thy sickle and reap. Well, who's the reapers? It's the angels. And then it says, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. Well, what does harvest represent? The end of the world. You see, I come from a background of many churches. I went to the Baptist church. I went to the Roman Catholic church. I also went to the Pentecostal or charismatic churches. I even became Muslim. I did all of this because I was seeking one thing, God. I just wanted to know who God was. And so I'm looking around and all these other things. But here it is all along. We got the Bible right here. And look at how God just narrows it down. God says, Dwayne, do you want to know where the message is that you should learn and sit under so that you may grow and be prepared for my coming? God says, all you got to do is read Revelation 14 because the Bible is very clear. The last message to be given before the world and then the end of the world will come is the first, second, and third angel's message. That's the last message to be given. Now, all I have to do is go to the Pentecostals and say, are you preaching three angels' messages? If they say no, that doesn't mean they're bad people. It just means that they're not the ones that's going to prepare for harvest time. Are you following that? I can go to the Roman Catholics and say, are you preaching three angels' messages? Our Roman Catholic brothers and sisters, they will say, uh, we're not familiar with that. Doesn't mean they're bad people. In fact, many of them are beautiful people. But the reality is, is that you all are not carrying a message that can prepare the world for harvest time. I can go to my dear brothers in Islam and say, okay, you have a respect for the Bible. You have a respect even for Jesus. Do you all have a three angels message? They're going to say a three angels what? And then I'm going to say, okay, doesn't mean you're bad people, but you are not the ones that can help prepare the world for the harvest time. Are you following? It's only when you come here that finally you're hearing, wow, there's a three angels' messages that's being given. Now, here's the thing to remember. To whom much is given, much is required. The more power you have is the more you and I will be held accountable by God on how we manage that power. You see, there are some people who are part of this church that will gloat over the fact we are the ones that have the message that will prepare the world for the coming of Jesus. But my brothers and sisters, knowing what I have, the amount of power that God has endowed to every single one of us, the angel had in its possession the everlasting gospel. That's a lot of power. And the more power that God trusts you and I with is the more God will hold us accountable to that power. So this is not a time for us to go in our heads and say, well, we got the right message. We are the people of God, so I'm sure we're just going to skate right on into heaven. No, brothers and sisters, that would never be the attitude of a converted man or a converted woman. If we are truly converted, we will realize that, Lord, you have given me something very precious and very special. And you know what you do when you have something very precious and very special? You handle it with care. Is that right? You handle it with care, family. And so God has made it very clear. This is the movement that has been given the messages that if that message is rightly understood and rightly received, boy, that message can help prepare the world for the coming of our beloved Savior. This is why we owe it to our friends and all of the religious communities to share. You see, I admit, you know, there are some people who talk about Bible prophecy, and like I told you on opening night, it instills all this fear in the heart, right? God's not trying to scare us into the kingdom because, quite honestly, that just doesn't work. That doesn't work. You can't be scared into eternity. It doesn't work. But it's okay to realize where you are in time so that you can do a self-assessment first and foremost and say, Lord, am I standing in right position with you? Because if I'm not, show me the way of everlasting life. But let's say you have the way of everlasting life. Let's say you know Jesus. And let's say you love him and you trust him. Well, first of all, I would say hallelujah and praise God. 
But then the second thing I would say to you is, is there's a whole different attitude now. You see, more, the more that I realize time is almost finished, it might affect that savings account that I have to buy a new boat. And it might make me say, you know, maybe a boat shouldn't be my focus. Maybe we should hold, get, help get a restaurant, a sanitarium, get something set up that we can make the gospel known to all these people that don't know that time is almost finished. You see, that's the, that's the next impact, is rather than it affecting us personally, it affects us externally. Go to Mark chapter 1. Let me show you it again. You see, in Mark chapter 1, what did Jesus do when he saw time being almost finished? I don't know about you, but I want to be like Jesus. I absolutely want to be like the Savior. And I want you to see what Jesus did when he saw prophecy being fulfilled. Oh, if only we could get on this page. The first effect of God when we see prophecy being fulfilled is for personal assessment. Lord, is everything all right between you and I? It's kind of like when a man finds out that he's dying. If a man gets a diagnosis from a doctor and he says, sir, I'm so sorry, to you. you have stage four cancer and you have four months to live. If that man is wise, knowing that time is almost finished, you know some of the things that man's going to ask himself? Lord, is everything right between you and I? Then he's probably going to go to his wife and say, honey, is everything right between us? Then he's probably going to go to his children and say, children, is everything good between us? Then he's going to think about people in his life that maybe there were some offenses or problems, and he's going to go to them because everybody wants to rest in peace. God wants us to understand that the beauty of understanding where we are in time and the preacher of God, to preach it with urgency, it is to awaken our hearts to say, Lord, first of all, is everything good between us? Because now that we see everything wrapping up, maybe I got a little lazy and maybe it's time for me to do an assessment on my own walk with you. That's first of all. But let's say you've answered that question. What should be the next impact? Mark chapter 1. In Mark chapter 1, Jesus exemplifies this for us. The Bible says in Mark, we're looking at the first chapter, and here's what it says. It says in verses 14 and 15. In Mark 1, verses 14 and 15, now, after that John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying what? The time is fulfilled. Wait a minute prophetic time was being fulfilled. So what did Jesus do when he saw that? The Bible says time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and do what? Believe the gospel. You see, for those of us who are secure in our relationship with Christ, the next thing that should happen in our lives when we see prophecy being fulfilled is we should get busy in preaching the gospel and calling others to repentance so they can be prepared to meet their God. You see, this is what God is trying to encourage in every single one of our hearts. I always marvel at Loma Linda. You know, this area is filled with a lot of money. There's, a, there's enough of God's people in this little area of Loma Linda that, man, we could do marvelous things for the glory of God to prepare people for the coming of the Lord. There are millions upon millions upon millions that flow all throughout Loma Linda. But why is it that there's no sanitarium here? Where are our hygienic restaurants? Where are our food factories? Where are the evangelism training schools and the city missions and the outposts? And where are these things? This is what gave us in our early years as a movement. This is what gave us tremendous success in reaching people. This is what made us a spectacle to the world when the H1N1 came through. When the Spanish flu came through, it was the Seventh-day Adventist sanitariums that had a 99% success rate of people being healed. You don't think after, when a, when a disease is killing everybody and the Seventh-day Adventist sanitariums were doing better than the hospitals and doing better than the United States Army. You don't think people were saying, what in the world do you guys understand that everybody else seems to be missing? It put us right in the position that we could say, like Daniel, 
it's not me, but our God. Grand opportunities, family. And so I think to myself, I guess the, the brethren here in Loma Linda area, maybe they're not hearing enough about Bible prophecy because it's not that there's lacking money, but maybe there's a lack of focus. Maybe there's a lack of focus. So what is God doing? God says, okay, I'm going to set a date and I'm going to send my messenger. And what I'm going to do is just tell him to just remind the people of a lot that they already heard, a lot that they already know, and just say, hey, it's time to once again wake up and get about God's business because time is almost finished. And that's why we're going through all these studies. And this is the last message that is to be given to the world so that the people can come to know Jesus in a very real, dynamic, powerful, practical, intimate way. Now, in order to do this, we're going to have to go deep. Okay? Now, I'm not doing that with you, because for me to do that, it would, it, it would require class time. It can't be like a preaching session. It would have to be class time. You and I need to really start getting some questions answered, okay? When I look at the first angel's message, there are four things that you need to understand, and you need to break it down biblically. Number one, you and I need to break down biblically. No Ellen White allowed. I'm not saying that Mrs. White is a bad person. Obviously, I don't believe that. I've been quoting the servant of the Lord night after night, so that's not an issue for me. But our message is not to just reach Adventists. Our message is to reach the world. And the world respects the Bible while they don't know about Ellen White. So you and I need to go to our Bibles and you need to answer these four questions. What does it mean to fear God? This is all of what's in the first angel's message. What does it mean to fear God? What does it mean to give glory to him? What is this hour of his judgment? And what is true worship? These are questions that you need to answer, and you need to answer it how? Biblically. When it comes to the second angel, you got to answer these questions. Who is Babylon? What does it mean to be fallen, fallen? Like, why did they say fallen, fallen? Why did they say that twice? What does wine represent? And what is this term, the wrath of her fornication? What is that about? And again, you have to explain it how? Biblically. Third angel's message, oh, you got a lot to answer. <laughs> Who is the beast? What is the image of the beast? What is the mark of the beast? What does forehead and hand represent? What constitutes patience? What does saint mean? What are the commandments of God? And what is the faith of Jesus? Now, let me tell you something. If you can learn how to answer all of those questions. Oh, by the way, there's one question that I would also put up there. And forgive me, I'm going to fix that thing. There's one more question that I'll put on first angel. What is the everlasting gospel? What is the everlasting gospel? You need to answer that question, okay? What is the everlasting gospel? Now, you have to, number one, understand the historical context of these messages. What does the, what, what are these, where did these messages come from? What did it mean historically? And then after that, you need to understand the practical context of the messages. Now, I'm just telling you right now, Show me a young man. This is why I love especially teaching young people, getting young missionaries together. Show me a young man, show me a young woman that can answer all of those questions biblically. You got yourself a powerhouse of a son and daughter of God. I'm serious. Now, knowledge alone will not do this. But if the heart is consecrated before the Lord and knows the answer to these things, powerhouse. You could turn Loma Linda upside down and any other place upside down with the everlasting gospel. So I'm putting this up there as a teaser. I'm trying to help you see, you need to make this your mission, family. When Brother Lemon's long gone, you need to make sure we are doing everything we can that we're going to get the answer to every single one of those questions. Every single one. You will see God will use you. He will use you mightily. People will hear you, and they will say, I want what you have. I remember I was in Maryland. And I was doing some meetings on all these messages. And I was doing these meetings on all these messages, and I was like, man, you know, presenting the word, right? And I was presenting it with passion because I love this message. I told you last night. I love this message, and I love this movement. 
And here it is that as I was learning these things, I'm growing. So here it is, I'm in Maryland, and I'm preaching. And I'm sharing the word of God with others. And as I'm sharing the word of God with others, this man comes in the meeting. I'll never forget that night. The room was packed. It had at least four to 500 people in it. But for some reason, my eyes locked on that brother when he walked in the room. My eyes fought, watched him as he walked up and sat up front. And I went again, and I was preaching the word, and then I made the appeal at the end. I said, how many of you want to turn your heart over to Jesus, your best friend? And this brother stood up. So he stood up, and he said, sir, he says, I'd like to talk with you. I said, no problem. We can talk. And he said, yeah. He says, uh, um, um, do you have some time? I said, well, I do. But I do have to prepare for something very quickly because I'm doing something tomorrow in a training. He said, can I come to the training? I was like, sure. So the next day he came. And when he came and sat down with me, he said, Mr. Lemon, he says, I have to tell you something. I said, what's that? He said, I battle with very severe depression. And I battled with it for a long time. He said, you don't know this. He said, I made a decision. I decided to rent an apartment in New Jersey. And I had everything set up that I was going to kill myself. I'm driving through Maryland to get to New Jersey. He said, and I passed this church, and I've never seen this church before. I can't make this up. The man said, I heard a voice say to me so loud, loud, turn around and go into that church. There's something there for you. He comes inside of the church, he says, and then I hear you. And he said, then here you are calling us to repentance, calling us to a God of love calling us to let us know that it's not too late. It might be late, but not too late. And he said, and I could not help but respond because he said, I knew it wasn't you. He said, I knew it was God. And then the tears start going down his eyes. But my tears are going down my eyes because I'm touched by his, his testimony. And then the man says to me, he puts his hand on my knee, and he says, Mr. Lemon, he says, I want what you have. And I told him, I said, my brother, I will give you everything I have. And that brother received Christ, his righteousness that day. What I'm trying to tell you is the more that you and I really understand what these messages are about, and if we really receive this in our hearts, and we consecrate ourselves to God, I promise you, people will come in contact with you and they are going to say to you what that man said to me. They're going to say, I want what you have. We have the solution to life's problems. There's a book that I love to read next to the Bible. The Bible's my favorite book. And then there's a book that I love to read next to the Bible that's my favorite. It's a little book called Ministry of Healing. Okay, the Ministry of Healing. It is on page 363 of that book that it says, the gospel is a wonderful simplifier of life's problems. Let me say that again. In the book, Ministry of Healing, page 363, it says, the gospel is a wonderful simplifier of life's problems. You know the one thing that we all have in common? It doesn't matter if you're black, white, Indonesian. It doesn't matter if you're male or female. It doesn't matter if we're young or old. You want to know the one thing we all have in common? Problems. Is that right? You better believe it. We all have problems. But you know what the Bible said? John the Revelator says, I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven having something. What did the angel have? The everlasting what? Gospel. And what is the gospel? A wonderful simplifier of life's problems. You see, somebody one time asked me the question, they said, Dwayne, what would you give as a nickname to Seventh-day Adventists? If, if, you could, if you took the name Seventh-day Adventists away and you had to give another name, what's the nickname that you would give to the movement? I would say problem solvers. 
problem solvers. Listen to me. I'm so serious. Listen, there is not a problem that we face in this world that the gospel cannot solve. Not a problem. And God is so good. You know, these glasses I'm wearing, these glasses are kind of cool. Can I tell you why? It's not because it, it's not because it makes me look good. That's not why. These glasses are cool because these glasses are actually bifocals. But you can't see the line. They now make glasses where they're so smooth the way they're made that when I look up, it, I see through one lens. But when I look down, it's a whole different lens. And it makes everything even more clear. Bifocals. Now watch this. Double lenses. <laughs> God gave us the Bible as a lens that we can look through so that when we see the issues of life, we can find in the everlasting gospel, in the truth as it is in Jesus, we can find a way to solve that problem. But some of us suffer so much with blindness. After all, that is one of the symptoms of the disease called Laodicea. Some of us suffer with such a deep level of blindness, you know what God had to do? God had to give us another lens. And that's those inspired writings of that servant of the Lord. And so now when we look through the Bible, first lens, and then we look through the spirit of prophecy, second lens, we're able to see things very, very clearly. You see, if you have a problem with education, you pick up your Bible and then you pick up the book, Education. If you have a problem with diet, you go to your Bible, but you also can pick up counsels on diets and foods. If you have a problem in the church, you pick up your Bible, but you pick up the nine volumes of the testimonies to the church. If you have a problem in your home, use the Bible and use Adventist home. You have a problem with your children, use the Bible and use child guidance. You have a problem with your young adults or your teenagers, you use your Bible and messages to young people. If you have a problem understanding the Bible, you should, of course, use your Bible. But you can also use patriarchs and prophets, prophets and kings, desire of ages, acts of the apostles, great controversy, Christ's object lessons, thoughts from the mouth of blessings. What problem do we have that God has not given us the resources to know exactly how to solve that problem? And that's why the devil's master plan is keep the people away from the books. Keep them away. Get them so busy that they talk more than they read. This is the plan of Satan. But that's why we're here having this revival. That's exactly what we, God is going to give us a revival of that primitive godliness. We're going to do what the primitive godliness was doing in back in the days. They were studying, they were praying. Listen, y'all don't even understand. We got some good food for you all. If you enjoyed Sunday night and you enjoyed last night and you enjoyed a little bit of tonight, brothers, you have no idea what else is prepared for you. Jesus loves you. He has prepared an amazing entree of messages that you are going to get, and I hope that you eat every bite on your plate. God has given us everything we need so that we can be the head and not the tail. But it all starts with the right message. You got to have the right message so that it can bring about the right experience. What is this? What do you call that? It's not a knife. It's a cleaver. <laughs> it's a cleaver, right? Now, I would, now, the only people who carry cleavers are butchers, right? That's what a, a butcher carries a cleaver. And you know what you do with a cleaver? You cut and you separate. Is that right? You cut and separate. I would like to suggest that we are not butchers. We don't go around cutting folks and making them separate, right? That's not what we do. Hey, there's butcher ministries. Remember I talked about the butcher ministries last night? They take the word of God to cut and separate the people of God from God's people. You remember we talked about that last night? They are not the ones that God's going to use to finish the work. But there, you are something. You know what you are? You know what I am? We're surgeons. You see, butchers and surgeons both use knives, but they have completely different purposes. A butcher uses a knife to cut and separate. 
A surgeon uses a knife to cut and heal. So if any of you felt cut last night, if you felt cut last night, I promise you, I was not coming to you in the capacity of a butcher. I was coming to you in the capacity of a surgeon. Sometimes the only way we can get healed is we need to get cut. But oh, how carefully we cut. The butcher just takes the chicken, just pop, split. Next one, pop, split. I mean, you know, that's what the butcher does. But the surgeon puts on special glasses. The surgeon takes their time. The surgeon makes sure that they don't have a nervous hand. And that surgeon just goes right there and just because he's cutting, but the cut is to heal. But there's a place for the cleaver because sometimes, like I told you, what do we do with the cleaver? We cut to separate. Did you know that God has a cleaver? And again, the purpose of a cleaver is to cut and separate. Do you know what God does with his cleaver? Take a look at this. God has called his church in this day as he called ancient Israel to stand as a what? Light in the earth. Didn't we study a lot about light last night? Remember that? We went over a whole bunch about light. Here it goes again. Now watch. God has called his church in this day as he called ancient Israel to stand as a light in the earth. Now watch this. Watch what will help us to be that light in the earth. It says, God has called his church in this day as he called ancient Israel to stand as a light in the earth by the mighty cleaver of truth. What is the mighty cleaver of truth? Continuing. The messages of the first, second, and third angels, he has separated them from two things. What are the two things we are to be separated from? the churches, and what else? From the world. To bring them into a sacred nearness to himself. He has made them the depositaries of his law and has committed to them the great truths of prophecy for this time. Like the holy oracles committed to ancient Israel, these are a sacred trust to be communicated to the world. Did you know that when God gave us these three angels' messages, it was as he was saying, I'm trusting you. Can you imagine God saying that to you? Hey, listen, all you who are pastors in my movement, God says, I'm trusting you. I think it's very solemn. I'm going to be honest with you. If my normal heart rate is 70 beats per minute, and then God comes to me and says, Dwayne, here's the most precious package that I can give to you that I want you to give to the world. Dwayne, I'm trusting you. I promise you, when I take that package from God, my heart rate just went to about 90. Why is it going to 90 beats per minute? It's not because, you know, when I think somebody here um, Sunday night, they said, Brother Lemon, are you nervous? He said, Pastor Lemon, are you nervous? I said, oh, yes. I'm nervous every time I go up to preach. Every time. When I go to speak somewhere, I get nervous, man. But I'll tell you this, I'm not nervous because of if you'll like me or not. I'm not nervous about that. I want you to like me. I like being liked. <laughs> you know, I'm not Superman. I like being liked. Don't get me wrong. But that's not what makes me nervous. You know what makes me nervous? Lord, help me to handle your word with care. That whatever comes out of my mouth will not cause fanaticism or will not cause laziness or apostasy. Help me, Father, to make sure that I articulate your word so clear that people will say we have received the word of God and our hearts have been stirred. I'm serious, y'all. There's not a night that I come before you that I don't have that nervousness. Lord, please help me to handle your word with so much care. My wife will tell you. When I was talking with my wife, by the way, I think she's watching. Hey, honey. But I'll, my wife will tell you that she would say, how are you feeling? I said, I'm nervous. I said, I'm nervous, honey. I said, can you pray for me? And then she would pray for me because it's like, I, I, want, to, I want to do justice. I want to handle this with care. Because I believe that when a man stands at the desk and when he preaches the word, he's standing between the dead and the living. 
And what comes out of his mouth must be a savor of life unto life and not death unto death. And so there's a nervousness that, that kind of comes commingled with that. So God is coming along and God is saying, I'm trusting you. When you take the position of an elder, when you take the position of a pastor, when you take the position of a deacon or a deaconess or an usher or what have you, you are now a leader in God's movement. And God is, as it were, looking down on you and he's saying, I'm trusting you. I'm trusting you that you're going to do well. Now, when God says that, he also is saying to you, and I'm going to give you all the power you need. And I'm going to walk with you every step of the way to make sure that you do handle with care what I've given you because you are going to do all things that I ask of you in the strength of my son, not in your own. I love the fact that God is on our side. I love the fact that God is determined to make sure that we do not fail. I love the fact that God is going to make sure that we don't lose. I'm telling you, if we're lost, we earned it. If we're lost, boy, did we earn that thing. Because it is hard to be lost. What do you think about that? We sometimes present it like it's so easy to be lost. Do you understand to be lost, you have to resist the love of God. That's not easy. God's love is so powerful. God's love is so magnetic that, brothers and sisters, I'm telling you, to resist the love of God takes effort. It takes determination. It takes a fixedness that I'm telling you, whoever is lost, man, they earned that one because God is determined to save you. Christianity is the weirdest religion in the world, isn't it? You go to all the other pagan religions, it's always about the wicked people chasing after the holy God. Doing all sorts of stuff. Praying a thousand times a day, saying God's name two thousand times a day, having to travel all over the world in special pilgrimages, and all this other stuff to appease and to serve and to worship this wonderful holy God. But here comes this strange thing called Christianity. Christianity is this amazing story about the holy, righteous God chasing after the sinner and saying, will you please accept me now? Will you please accept me now? I'm telling you, family, if we're lost, we earn that thing because God is determined to do everything possible to make sure that you do not lose but that you win. That's why even very wicked people are still alive because God is determined to win that soul and to give them a chance to finally turn their hearts over to him. Now, I want you to look back at this. Let's put that back up on the screen. Now, I want to finish that quote here. Looking back at the screen now, it says, he has separated them from the churches and from the world to bring them into a sacred nearness to himself. He has made them the depositaries of his law and has committed to them the great truths of prophecy for this time. Like the holy oracles committed to ancient Israel, these are a sacred trust communicated to the world. So God is trusting you, family. That's why I spent a great number of my life disappointing God. I want to spend the last few years of it pleasing him. I just want to do that. And I believe you want to do the same. And that's why we're here night after night. Numbers growing every single night. Now watch this. When I look at these verses in the Bible, Matthew 3, 2, and saying, repent ye for the kingdom of God of heaven is what? At hand, right? That term, the kingdom of heaven is at hand, it can actually have a present tense meaning. You know that? Because right here, in Luke 17, 21, it says, neither shall they say low here or low there, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. The kingdom of God's grace, right? That was a present truth. Oh, did you catch that? Did you catch that? That was a present truth. It was something that was going on right now, when it was said. But when you go to Joel chapter 2, verse 1, the Bible says, Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. You see, 
the messages that God has always given to his people were either for the time that they were living in or for what was coming in the very near future. What you don't find God's messengers doing is talking a lot about the past that has no further relevance. Listen carefully to what I just said. God's messengers in the Bible would give messages that were for the immediate time as well as for the future. But it was never dwelling on the past that had no relevance for the present time or the future. Now, the reason why I say that is because that's the context of this thing called present truth. We're told in inspiration, I saw the necessity of the messengers, especially watching and checking all fanaticism, wherever they might see it rise. Satan is present in on every side and unless we watch for him and have our eyes open to his devices and snares and have on the whole armor of God the fiery dart of the wicked will hit us there are many precious truths contained in the word of God but it is present truth that the flock needs now I have seen the danger of the messengers running off from the important points of present truth to dwell upon subjects that are not calculated to unite the flock and sanctify the soul. Everything that we preach should be for those two purposes. Unite the flock, sanctify the soul. Whatever comes from this pulpit, whatever comes from any pulpit, whatever books we produce, whatever businesses we start, the ultimate goal is to meet the spiritual needs of the people so that it can unite the flock and sanctify the soul. It says Satan will here take every possible advantage to injure the cause. Get the people off track. So point number one, the three angels' messages are the last message of love, hope, and warning to be given to the world right before Jesus' return. It also, these are the messages that allows us to remain distinct and separate from the world and the fallen churches that constitutes Babylon. We need to stop trying to be like the other churches around us. This stuff is killing us. The people are looking for more. Like I just told you, if we start thinking that the way we're going to serve the members is by not preaching three angels, not talking about the present truth, keep these things away. Just give them lullaby stories and sprinkle it with Jesus' name on it. You don't love the people. If you love the people, you give the people what they need, not what they want. Can you imagine a parent that gave their child always what they wanted? That child would be a spoiled brat and a curse to society. A good parent says no to their children sometimes, right? Why? Because we know better than they. And when you love your child, you're going to tell them, I understand that you want this, but hey, I'm not going to give you this because I'm going to give you something better. God says the same thing. We are not doing any favors by deviating from the first, second, and third angel. We're not doing any favors for the people. We're not helping them. There's prophecy being fulfilled. We saw that. Jesus is saying, get my people ready. And so it is again. The messages of the three angels, it, it, it works as a beautiful separation mechanism that we're not going to reflect the principles of the world and we're not going to reflect the principles in the churches that constitutes Babylon. Pray for the leaders. Pray for the ministers. Pray for the members. We have a serious problem right now. We have too many unconverted members and too many weak leaders. And it makes a horrible combination. We need to get to the place to say, Lord, help me to be about your business. Help me to do what you told me to do. And God says these are the messages that you give, whether the people like it or love it. But you make sure you give it. The mighty cleaver of truth was sent by God's own hand to separate us from the world and from the churches, and we should be separate. Finally, all messages given by God's people should reflect in either detail or principle these messages. Not every sermon has to have Revelation 14 in it. You understand that? 
not every sermon has to have the quoting of Revelation 14, but every sermon should, every book should, every message, every lecture, every Sabbath school lesson should, in detail or in principle, be in harmony with these messages, which is to do what? True unity amongst the flock and true sanctification of the soul. If you understand what I'm saying thus far, let me hear you say amen. Now, the Bible also says, for our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance, as you know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. Paul continues by saying, for I determined not to know anything among you, say Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I, and I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with the enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. I want you to notice that the apostle Paul says the gospel that he brought to the people was not just words, but also demonstration. You follow that? Don't lose that. Now, we are told the theme of greatest importance is the third angel's message, embracing the messages of the first and second angels. All should understand the truths contained in these messages, but watch, and demonstrate them in daily life, for this is essential to salvation. So notice that it's not enough to just know the three angels' messages. It's not enough to just understand the three angels' messages. We need to make sure that we are demonstrating these messages in our daily life. So point number two, the three angels' messages are not merely to be preached and taught, but demonstrated or lived out in our daily lives. If we believe that time is almost finished, if we believe that, if we believe that Jesus' is coming is near even at the doors, should that not affect how you spend your money? Should it not? Should it not affect our financial goals? You remember last night I told you about love? If you really love the people, if you see that they're suffering, what if God has given us the wisdom to know how to create things so that people don't have to suffer as much? But it might require you to take some of the savings out that you were using to do something really fun to do something just a little bit more important. You see, what God is trying to say is if we really believe the three angels, it's going to reflect in our daily life. We're not just going to be casual and loose with our money. We're not just going to be casual and loose with our time. Now, please, what I'm not saying is that you can't have a nice car. I'm not saying that you can't go on a nice vacation. I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is, is that you might pray more about it. Maybe you don't have to go on as expensive a vacation save a few thousand dollars and put it into the work of the gospel that can maybe help 10, 20, 30, 50, 100 or more souls receive the messages of the hour. That's what happens. So when we talk about, oh, the three angels' messages, it must be brought into the daily life. This is all I'm saying, is the more that we understand the messages, it's going to start impacting our daily life. It's going to impact you. It's going to impact the way where you live. Next week, we're going to talk a little bit about something about country living. We're going to actually talk about that. What does God's word say about it? Is that just something a bunch of kooky, crazy Adventists do? Or is that something that might be a little bit of heaven's instruction for his people? We're going to talk about it. God wants us to understand that if we really believe the messages, it will start reflecting in our life. Our lives will start looking more and more like people who are preparing to meet God and not just people who are preparing to build earthly empires. If we really believe the message, that's all I'm saying. Noah, man, you got to be kidding me. You, you know why, listen, you know what was so powerful about Noah? Every time Noah's hammer hit the ark, it was a sermon. Because you know one thing people would say about Noah? Is they would walk and say, you know, I don't really believe Noah. Because it never rained before, and he's talking about it's going to rain. You know it never rained before. It never rained before until the day of the flood. Never rained. No rain. 
dew would come from the ground and then water the earth. But there never was any rain. So Noah's message was very, very weird. But do you know one thing the people would say? They'd say, you know, I don't know about Noah. I mean, his brother's saying that it's going to rain and floods coming from the sky and all that. But the one thing everybody had to admit, everybody had to admit, everybody had to admit, is when they walked by and saw Noah again in the morning, in the afternoon, hammering on that ark, you know what everybody said? That brother might be crazy, but he really believes his message. That's, that's the one thing everybody had to admit. They might say, I don't, I don't, I don't know if I'm going to follow what Noah says. But one thing is for sure, everybody who saw Noah, they said, man, that brother believes his message. His lifestyle proves that he believes what he's talking about. That's what you want to ask yourself is, Lord, do I really believe these messages? Do I really believe time is almost finished? Do I really believe about the mark of the beast and all this other stuff? Do I really believe the everlasting gospel and that my best friend is coming? And if I really believe it, ask yourself, does my lifestyle, does my conduct, do my words show that I believe this. Now, about to wrap this up here. The first angel's message is a message of investigative judgment. I want you to look at these here. We won't go through all these verses because I want to do better on our time tonight than we did last night, so I'm, I'm, I'm moving forward. If you look up these Bible verses, you can take your phones out, take pictures of them so you can study the Bible verses, but the first angel's message is a message of investigative judgment. James tells us we are judged by the law of God. The second angel's message is a call to come away from the location and condition of Babylon. Babylon wants to tear us away from God's law. That's the whole mission of Babylon, is to keep the people away from God and his law. The third angel's message warns about the mark of the beast and encourages us to keep the commandments of God, which we are able to do as a result of having the faith of Jesus Christ and being patient saints. All three messages brings us back to God and his law. This is why point number three, all of the messages call us to an acknowledgement and keeping of God's holy law, or Ten Commandments, in spite of all demonic effort to do away with it or make it of none effect. Every day, we should be asking ourselves, is my life in cooperation with God? I firmly believe that righteousness by faith, victory over sin, all these things, falls under one word, cooperation. Are you cooperating with God? There's a part that you do, there's a part that God does. God gives all the resources and all the power and everything. What do we do? We yield. We yield. We say, yes, Lord, not my will. Your will be done. And God gives us all the power to obey him and to do whatever he says. But God makes it very clear. This is the call. And lastly, and boy, do I love this part. I started to look up verses in the Bible. And again, I want you to take pictures. We won't go through these verses, but you can take the pictures. Did you know that Proverbs 8 and verse 13 says, the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. And I thought about that. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. But Jeremiah 13 says, the problem is we love evil. How do you tell somebody to hate what they naturally love? But then God comes along in Psalm 97 and verse 10. And you know what God says in Psalm 97 and verse 10? He says, you who love the Lord hate evil. You see, you can't hate evil unless you first love the Lord. This is why it is backwards to tell everybody to turn away from sin without first introducing them to the one who gives them power to turn away from sin. You can't stop sinning. You can't hate evil unless you first love God. 
And one of the great problems that we have is many of us are trying to hate evil, but we have yet still to develop a true love for the Lord. That's why the first angel's message is rooted in love. It's the only way the first angel's message will work, is love. Second angel's message in Revelation, you know, second angel's message is, you know, we have to rebuke Babylon. That, that's what Revelation 18 says. We're going to tell everybody, come out of her. Her sins have reached unto heaven. We rebuke the evils in Babylon and call the people out. But Revelation 3.19 says, as many as I love, I rebuke. That's why I told you last night, though we see sins in the church, and though we see sins in the church that need to be corrected, if you do not have love for the soul that you are rebuking, it is better that you do not rebuke because you'll end up hurting them. You don't rebuke sin because you're just sick and tired of it. You got to learn how to hate sin, but you got to love the sinner. And until you and I learn that lesson, you probably should not go around rebuking the sin. Let somebody else do it who loves the sinner. They'll do a better job. But there's no way we're going to rebuke Babylon and call everybody out except the love of God be the motivating factor. The third angel calls us to keep God's commandments. Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Love is what makes all of this work. You see, the way that I will understand, the way that I will appreciate, the way that I will live out the first, second, and third angel's message, the way God designed, is when he puts his love within our hearts. This is what Jesus said in John 13 and verse 35 when he said, this, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have love one to another. But wait a minute, what is the this? The this is verse 34 where Jesus says, a new commandment I give unto you that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, Christ's love, shall all men know that you are my disciples. This is what God was trying to teach us, is that that beautiful chapter of 1 Corinthians 13, this should be our daily homework. Do you know I read this chapter every day? I read this chapter every day because it helps me. I always tell people Christianity is easy to practice, isn't it? Y'all looking at me like, no, it is not. <laughs> Christianity is easy to practice as long as you don't have to deal with people. That's where it gets hard, right? Christianity gets hard when you got to deal with people. And you know what? My, my line of work, oh man, I deal with a lot of people, very different people. And so you know what God has taught me? Every day, Dwayne, I want you to read 1 Corinthians 13. I do a devotion in the morning. Every morning I meet with God, me and God meet together one-on-one, -on -one, and I'm going to talk about that. I can't wait to talk to you about that. But every morning I meet with the Lord, and then when I'm finished going through whatever I'm going through in my devotional studies, I close out the study with reading 1 Corinthians 13. And the reason that I do that is because I know I need a reminder that love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not boast and exalt itself. I have to remind myself of that every day. And it's not a wonder. Look at what inspiration says. We're wrapping up. The Lord desires me to call the attention of his people to the 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians. What does the servant of the Lord say? Oh, let me see if I can put it here. Nope, I don't want that one. I want this one. Yeah, look at this. What does she say? Watch this. Read this chapter how often? Every day. Isn't that something? The spirit of prophecy, the testimony of Jesus says, read this chapter every day. God knows what he's talking about. It says, read this chapter every day and from it obtain comfort and strength. Learn from it the value that God places on sanctified, heaven-born love. And let the lesson that it teaches come home to your hearts. Learn that Christ-like love is of heavenly birth and that without all and without it, all other qualifications are worthless. 
You see, if we just have an external or historical understanding of the three angels, but it's not leading us to Christ our righteousness and allowing his love to be transforming our hearts. If it's not doing that, something's wrong with how you're reading the three angels. Something's wrong with how I'm reading the three angels. These three angels' messages should draw us closer to Jesus, that we behold him, and by beholding him, we become changed into the same image. I'm serious, family. If that's not happening, you have to ask yourself the question, why, what am I doing wrong? Because I promise you, it's not God. The problem is us. It's not him. If you rightly understand prophecy and if you rightly understand the three angels, you should be more patient with people, not less. You should be more self-controlled, not less. You should be more kind, not easily rude. And that includes to your husband. That includes to your wife. That includes to your children. I'm serious, family. Something's wrong with us. If we're still acting these ways, but we're so deep in our studies, what's going on? How do you behold God and become less patient? How do you behold God and become more unkind? How do you behold God and it's a lot easier to gossip about everybody? God is trying to say something's wrong with our connection with him. Something's wrong. Something's missing. I looked up each of these words in the Greek. When it says love is long-suffering, it means it endures patiently. When it says kind, it means benevolent. You, des you have this constant desire to help others. This is love. Love makes you want to help other people. It promotes it. It prompts it in the heart. It, when it says envies not, it means it's not jealous over, and it doesn't covet. Then when it says not puffed up, it means it's not boastful and proud. When it says does not behave itself unseemly, that term unseemly means unbecoming, indecent, and unattractive. I used to always tell my children, ugly is not a look, it's a character. I used to always tell my children that ugly is not a look, it's a character. I don't believe there's anybody who's ugly. They, they, you know, they, there's different strokes for different folks. Some, pe some person will say you're handsome, some people won't. But ugly is very much a character. And the Bible proves that. Does not behave itself unseemly. What is unseemly? When you are unattractive. The way you're acting right now is so unattractive. That's not God's love. God's love is very attractive, very drawing. It goes on to say, it is not glad when wrong things happen, but only when right things happen. This is love. This is God's love. It then says, it endures trials patiently, it never stops trusting, and it remains in a constant state of hope. This is love. Constant state of hope. You ever met some Christians that are hopeless? They just need to be reintroduced to God's love. So when we carefully study these three angels, family, oh, it's something that never stops. When it says love never fails, that was the last description. Love never fails. This is love. I see some cameras. I want you to get your pictures in. I want you to be edified from this study. We're talking about the three angels. We're talking about the last message that's to be lived out in you and I. Point number four, which is our last point for the night. The foundation of the three angels' messages is love, God's love. Without this in the heart of its possessor, all other efforts are useless. The end result of God's love in the heart is victory over all sin. You see, that's the only way we can stop doing the thing that breaks the heart of Christ. This is why Jesus would say to the man at the pool of Bethesda in John 5, sin no more. This is why Jesus would say to the woman caught in adultery in John 8, he would say, sin no more. What did both of them come in contact with? They came in contact with the love of God. The more that they beheld the love of God, they were both in impossible, condemnatory situations. That woman knew, I am under a death sentence. I am supposed to die. I was caught in adultery. 
That man knew, I brought sin on myself. I did this. That's why Jesus said, sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. His sins brought on whatever he was sick with for 38 years. They were self-condemned. And here comes the messenger of mercy. Not just the messenger of judgment, but the messenger of mercy. And Jesus says to that man, do you want to get well? Sir, I try to get in the pool all the time. Jesus bypasses all of his excuses. He says, get up. Take up your mat and just start walking. He clings to the word of God, and he gets up and he starts walking. That woman, boy, I can imagine she already was feeling the stones falling on her. And Jesus sees all these righteous men all around him, so they think. And Jesus just says, okay, adulterer, thief, liar. And he just starts writing out all their sins in the sand. And one by one, those guys are like, yeah, ooh. And they see Jesus now pointing out their sins. And the Bible says one by one, they said, okay, we're out of here. Jesus looks around, he says, woman, he says, uh, you know, where are your accusers? Did any of them condemn you? She says, no. And I like how one brother put it. If you read John A's story, the Bible says she says, no, Lord. But the way one friend of mine put it is he said what the woman was saying was, when Jesus said, did anyone condemn you? She said, no. And then she looked at him like, Lord, what are you going to do? And then Jesus says, neither do I condemn you. Go. Don't do this again. And do you know that that was not just a message for the guy at the pool of Bethesda? That was not just a message for the woman who was caught in adultery. Because 1 John 2 and verse 1 says, My little children, that's all of us, these things write I unto you that you sin not. Can you imagine that? God wants us to stop doing the thing that breaks his heart. But the only way that that will ever be a reality is Jesus says, you got to love me first. The more you love me, you will keep my commandments. And this is the promise that Christ leaves with each and every one of us. And that's why beginning tomorrow night now, I'm going to show you a story about the plan of salvation, something that Jesus did. I'm going to show you how low Christ came down to make sure that you and I can receive the everlasting gospel in our hearts and be changed into that glorious image. And so tonight I leave you with the message of the hour. There is no other message, family. Please don't deviate. Please don't move from it. But understand it. And then by the grace of God, demonstrate it in daily life. What is that message? The first, the second, and the third angel's message. This is the message of the hour that is going to help us prepare to meet our God. Question, how many of us understood the study tonight? Do we understand the study? Is it your heart's desire to say, Lord, I am determined to learn the everlasting gospel I am determined to understand the last message of love, hope, and warning before Jesus comes so that I can not only understand it, but I can experience it in my life and that I can become a new creature in Christ. If that's you, please stand to your feet with me. I want to go ahead and have a word of prayer with you and for you, and I know that God will bless you well beyond your expectations. Let us all stand together and let us pray and let us thank the Lord for opening our eyes and helping us to behold wondrous things out of his law. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, Lord, we want to thank you so much for the wonderful words that you've given to us tonight. We thank you for the precious power of your Holy Spirit. We thank you for truth as it is in Jesus. And we thank you, Lord, that we are able to have the message of the hour that will help us prepare to meet our God. Please, Lord, help us to handle this message with care is our prayer that we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.
Show.